Hi, I, I don't know. Can you hear me? We can hear you perfectly. Welcome uh, to the show. What have, great. You, what have well, you got you. for us? Well, I just wanted to say I'm, uh, I subscribe to all of your channels on YouTube, and I like them all. Uh, you've taught me a lot, and I thank you all for that. Um, what, I, what I wanted to ask about is I saw a show on the uh, History Channel. Well, I saw five minutes of a show on a History Channel called Proving God. And in that show, the five minutes I saw, they were talking about something called the, uh, the God gene and how it pre, um, well, the show was saying how God must have um, had a hand in evolution to create this gene, but, you know, which, as they say, some biologists believe it, which I never really believe when they say some biologists believe or some anybody believes anything and don't give any backup for that. But uh, the hypothesis online for the God gene says um, that it's, uh, basic, it's based on behavioral, genetic, neurobi neurobiological, and psychobiological studies. The major arguments of the theory are spirit spirituality can be quantified by psychometric measurements. The underlying tendency of spirit um, spirituality is partially heritable. This herit heritability can be attributed to the gene VMAT2. The gene acts by altering uh, monomine levels, and spiritual individuals are favored by natural selection because they are provided with an innate sense of optimism, the la latter producing positive effects that are either physical or psycho and psychological level. Um, that was basically from Wikipedia. So uh, basically, what, what are your thoughts on this gene? Have you heard anything about it? And um, I mean, what my take for it would be it would explain why people who have these religious experiences really believe them so much because they have a chemical reaction going on there in their brain. It doesn't really prove the existence of God. And it, if anything, it kind of proves only the existence of their personal God in their head. And that's just about it but just wanted to get what your takes were on that. Well, if, if I'm, I'm quick reading this, I, I'd never heard of this before. It, it's the SLC, uh, SLC 18A2 solid carrier family. Um, you know, this is, this is designed concordance, to sell Concordance, you're, you're, you're talking to the general public now. You're going to have to explain. No, yeah, 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 yeah. I just, I just, just give it, no, just give us a fancy words. I know, but give us a, an idea of what you're actually talking about. Oh, so this is a gene that is possibly enriched in people who consider themselves deeply spiritual. So it, it would actually be a genetic cause for people being religiously fundamental or or uh, enthusiastically religious. Can I, can I pause you there? Uh, Please. And just explain for me, maybe the audience are more knowledgeable. What do you mean by you say genetically enriched? A gene is a gene, surely. It's going to be present or not present. How could it have an enriched gene? Everybody has a copy of it. Mm -hmm. So how, what, what do you mean? What do you mean by when when you say it's enriched? I'm saying there's a particular variation of it which is associated with um, deep religious experience, um, and they're also seeing that it's modulated. It, uh, modulated, uh, change. It, it goes up or down, I'm not sure which, when people have religious experiences. Um, but, you know, this is, this is a great example of a way to sell a book. You know, bad science dressed up with a tagline so that people will buy it. Um, there, there's no reason to suspect that this is in, involved in anything other than neurotransmitter uh, regulation. It's interesting. It's al always interesting to understand the biological basis for these things. But it, it's a serotonin related metabolism gene. So if you're familiar with antidepressants called the serotonin selective reuptake inhibitors, which I'm sure you are, DPR. SSRIs, right? Which are the. Uh, I, I read about little else. <laughs> they're the modern version, a modern incarnation of antidepressants. They would modulate these kinds of things. So people who have depressive symptoms and people who have transcendent experiences, this might be related or might be implicated. How do, how do you, 
how do you explain this general phenomenon of scientists who write books or, or science writers who write books and try to sell them with something controversial or they try to develop this narrative of some little thing, some new discovery, and they try to turn it into some larger explanation. And this is this is the criticism about evolutionary biology as well, is you take this one little relationship and you try to expand it out into something that really doesn't support. It's bad science, but it's good fiction. Yeah, I mean, the thing about uh, God is a feel-good factor, um, I mean, it might make you feel good, but... Um, so does drugs. Um, so whilst it might explain why people do it, uh, um, that wouldn't explain the origin, unless it's a sort of emotional masturbation, but there's no particular reason why that should have a selective advantage. I mean, if I were looking for um, origins of um, religion, I would far more go down the um, that it has social reinforcement. It, it has a social reinforcement role. Uh, I, I'll give you a, a short quote from Carl Zimmer. If you don't know Carl Zimmer, he's a fantastic science writer. I don't always agree with him on everything, but um, he does a fantastic job of talking about science in a, in a very approachable way. Uh, he says, given the low explanatory power of VMAT2, it can be characterized as a gene that accounts for less than 1% of the variance of self-transcendent states. Uh, that can signify anything from belonging to the Green Party to believing in ESP. Uh, so calling it the God gene based on this one unpublished study that found a weak association between certain variations of this gene and uh, transcendent experience doesn't really tell us much. I mean, whilst I would agree, I mean, it does seem to me that... Um, I, I, actually, this, this this is a hereditary argument, but it's not a genetic hereditary argument is that non-belief does seem to run in families. But then again, so does belief. Um, you know, if your parents are Christian, you're likely to be religious. But that's not an evolutionary argument, that's a cultural one. Yeah? Or you would reach for the cultural argument long before you re reached for the genetic argument. Yeah, I, it just seems more appropriate for the venue. It's the kind of thing that we love to hear about, because it makes the world make sense. Right now, we have an explanation for why certain people could possibly believe things that we don't, or can behave in ways that we don't feel the need to behave. Well, they're hardwired for it. I I don't think that's likely in this case. Now, if you do want to investigate the origins of religion, then I think the anthropology is much more interesting. You know, the 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 primitive belief systems of pre-scientific, pre-historical people um, can tell us a lot more, I think, than an examination of our genome when it comes to social constructs like this. If you, you, if you start to sort of use your intuition and your common sense with genetics, there's such a good chance that you're going to deceive yourself. If you go looking for, you know, an explanation for X is gene Y, nine times out of ten that has been a frustrating and unproductive search. Uh, even when the evidence is there, the d the deeper you dig, the more you find that people are not blank slates, but the genes alone are never fully explanatory. Um, yeah, I mean, it's it, always it, a it, complex interaction. Um, Steve, it, uh, I, I, I see that you're being interrupted. I don't know whether you're being dragged away, um, but uh, I was going to come back to you, but uh, Thunder obviously wants to comment. Thunder, then back to Steve. There's a degree of plasticity in um, in anything that a gene might prescribe, um, uh, particularly with things like behaviour, um, and so you do end up in this rather unpleasant no man's land of the sort of nature versus nurture, and neither of these are both of these are very significant contributors. Um, to the outcome, and it's even more complex with societies because these things can can be metastable. You know, they can be either stable in one state or another state um, for long periods of time. So it it gets very difficult to describe um, the problem. Um, 
But for certain, you, you, the, the coarser grain you look at the problem, the, the more uh, certain factors do seem to stand out. And uh, for certain, we are social primates. Um, and things. one of the things that religion certainly does is act as a bonding agent for social primates. So you can see how these things may have been advantageous in the past. That, you know, you need a reason why uh, you know, you're the good guys and they're the bad guys. And that's, that's religion. Steve, back to you. I know I knew you're being distracted at the moment. Um, uh, yeah, it was uh, my four-year-old who was uh, playing playing behind me. Who's does he does he want wife. to appear? Does he want to appear on the show? Sure. Here we go. Come here, buddy. Can I you think, say I hi? Think, I think this is our. Uh... Oh, hi, mommy. Okay. <laughs> hi, little one. M- mommy says hi back. <laughs> um, hey, go to mommy. Go find mommy. I think that's the youngest caller we've ever had on the show. <laughs> Cute kid. Okay, well, that, that's basically what I thought. And yeah, I, I know that it hasn't really been proven. It was only ever published in a book, that, and the guy who published it never put it up for any type of scientific uh, review before he published it. Right. But I just thought it was an interesting thing. And it was also interesting that the History Channel was, you know, using this as to prove God. I'm not really sure why proving God has anything really to do with history, but I've never known that about Pawn Stars or Ice Road Truckers either. So there you go. Right. Yeah, they they've degenerated over time. I think the <laughs> what started out as a very good science channel has turned into the UFO channel. I have to say, <laughs> I'm staggered coaches. as to how you can make so many programs about ice road truckers. I, it's just. <laughs> uh, so this is my question: When it comes to atheism, I've been following uh, uh, most of you. Uh, on YouTube and so on, and uh, most of us. Of course, there's, I mean, I'm, there's only three of us. Most yeah, I know, but Aaron Ra is not there. Oh, I, I follow. Okay. And and, uh, and uh, the thing is, I'm a non-believer as well, non-theist. But the thing is, uh, <clears throat> it's, it, it feels like it's starting to grow so fast, and you have so many aggressive atheists or non-theists out there that really try to, uh, you know, ridicule most people that have, you know, believe in something. And I'm thinking, where should the line be drawn? I mean, uh, we're living in a, in a Western society where we have, we have time, we have space, we have food, you know, abundance of everything. So we're pretty good off, well off, you know. And then you have other people that are, for example, let's say uh, uh, India or some other place or someone who has someone who's very dear to them and he's about, he's, that person is dying, you know. Maybe those people need a little bit of faith. So, you know, in order, even though it's, it's for us imaginary and it's a superficial and, a, 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 you know, we don't believe in that. But where do you, where do you consider, where should you draw the line? Yeah, I'm sorry, can you clarify exactly the question you're asking? Is this, where, where, do you, where are you supposed to draw the line when it comes to, because I, I, I've been doing this a lot, you know, whenever I, I, I just love when, when I have Jehovah's Witnesses coming to the door. I mean, there's, I, there's nothing, that's the most fun you can have. I'll go first. Um, if they're uh, terminally ill and not actually affecting anyone, anyone else, that's not a problem. If they're religious and keeping it themselves, that's not a problem. The only time that I actually have a problem with people indulging in this sort of behavior is when they're actually doing social harm with it. When they're telling people that you shouldn't get the blood transfusion because that'll piss God off, or that wearing a condom in the middle of an AIDS epidemic will piss God off. Um, Or any one of a a horde of these things, you know, you, you should kill, um, you know, the uh, apostate because otherwise it will piss God off. Um, other than that, what people do in the privacy of their own minds, I see is entirely their own affair. Okay. I couldn't agree more. Uh, and, and nor can you do anything about it. If, if someone wants to believe in something, it's, it's impossible almost yeah. uh, the to... Yeah. Persuade them otherwise, um, but if, as long as it, as Thunder says, as long as it doesn't interfere with 
society or have a, have a negative effect on society, then what's the problem? Okay, but then we go back. Uh, they must learn about this from somewhere, from some source. Otherwise, they wouldn't know. Do you see what I mean? About atheism, yeah. you mean? No, 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 about theism. Oh. They have to learn about theism somewhere. And especially I, I, in, in, in places where they don't have an abundance of anything. You know, they I, really I, don't I'd like have to disagree with yeah. you, Mike, before you go yeah, too please, far. Please I, I, I would disagree with you that religion necessarily makes people happier. I, I, I think that's it doesn't, a, that's it's a, a comfort. Claim. It's a comfort. I think it's a comfort. If you're, a, let's say, a child, you're, you're losing, you've already lost your father. Now you're losing your mother to cancer. You know what I mean? You well, probably need something. Are you saying that you don't think that someone who lacks a belief could also be comforted? Absolutely. But this is a different, this is like a first aid kit. It sort of explains things that are really, really huge. And it sort of gives you a comfort in those well, last I, moments. I, I'm sorry. And, I, and do that's have, what I, mean. I, I do have to disagree with you. It doesn't explain anything. It may give them comfort, but it doesn't explain exactly. anything. Now, that comfort, no. yeah, certainly. It's false. Uh, the Based idea, on false premises. Yeah, I know fine. That. If, I understand if, that. If somebody wants to believe that they're going to meet up with their dead relatives in some theme park in the sky, mm -hmm. fine, not a problem. But I do have an issue with when you say, well, you know, or what you seem to be implying, which is that, you know, why shouldn't we just let these people have these beliefs? Because it's all nice and pleasant. No, hang on a second. As a child, I remember through the religious indoctrination I was given of being terrified of God and terrified of hell. So there is a balance here, and I think that in imbuing in a small child such terror and fear is a form of child abuse. I, I guess that's what I'm trying to say, Mike, not, not in quite those same terms, but I actually think that comfort can be gained from things other than religion. I, I don't think that you're putting them at a disadvantage in coping if you take that away from them. I, I don't think the right time to confront someone is when they're already on the ropes emotionally or, or financially. Yeah. I don't think you want to antagonize someone who's already hurting, but I would challenge the idea that somehow there's more comfort to be found in, in folk belief. It, you know, it's, it's a very similar to debate to what people argue about alternatives to medicine, alternative medicine. Um, you know, people say, well, let them have their chiropractic, let them have their, their herbalism or their shamanism or whatever it may be, because it makes them feel good. And, you know, they're, they're nothing that modern medicine has to offer them. And that's true to an extent, but there's also harm created by letting them do those things. And they may later come to blame the pain they experience on, on the myth. You know, I'll give you an example because I'm, I'm trying to miss my own points. My kids have had a lot of pets. Of course, a lot of the pets have died, you know, little gerbil, little goldfish, whatever. How do you tell a, a non believing child what, what is the difference in how you cope? You can tell them, well, you know, your goldfish is with God now, right? And, and that's a very simple answer, but it, it can lead to all sorts of other things. I think that's what DPR was leading towards. To being very worried that you know what what is is God feeding my fish? Is God taking care of my fish? Is God going to flush them in the the heaven toilet or whatever? I just tell my kid your memories of that fish keep it alive in your thoughts, and your fish had a happy life, and during its life it experienced um, happiness, and it brought you joy, and that's something special that it created. You don't have to have the myths to have the comfort. That comes from the real world, uh, um, real can I, experiences. Can I, can I pick up on um, a comment that I, I, I apologize? I didn't make a note of the person who posted it, but the comment was, "Didn't you watch Doctor Who as a child, DPR?" And I suspect they're, they're suggesting that I was as terrified by watching Doctor Who as I was by being indoctrinated into the belief of um, the existence of a god and a hell. I, I think that's an appalling analogy. And there are a number of reasons. Firstly, I was not led off to a building once a week um, to be taught that Doctor Who and the Daleks 
are true. Uh, Doctor Who was not supported by state, ins well, it's not really state institutions, but huge institutions. I was not given lessons at school uh, where I was told that the Daleks really did exist. Um, and I wasn't told that Doctor Who was true. All of those things I was told about religion. So I, I'm sorry, I just think it's an appalling analogy. Yeah, I mean, more to the point, if you were to actually have people um, who really believe Doctor Who was true, kind of like Trekkies on steroids or something, but with Doctor Who, um, and like you were saying, that they would actually lead each other, they would go in a, a weekly procession to the Dalek shelter, <laughs> where they would hide from the um, oncoming sl slaughter that the Daleks would someday ravage on the Earth then maybe. Because the thing is, I live in Sweden, and in Sweden, we really don't need God, which is pretty much proven here, because, uh, I mean, the churches are, are being sold and so on. So no one really thinks about, you know, very, very few people are witnesses or, or, you know, Christians or, well, we have a lot of Muslims now, but, uh, but I'm thinking, you know, here we don't need it because we have everything. But if you are in a in a in a very extremely poor country, and I, I agree with you when it comes to indoctrination and uh, you know the uh, you know trying to tell children about the devil and you're going to burn and you're a sinner, of course I'm not for that. But if you come to a place, if you are, I mean, I'm just thinking about those people, like in India or or some really poor place. I mean, they have nothing. They're not going to have anything either. And it doesn't matter what they do. They're not going to have anything. So the only sort of comfort that they have is that they're going to be able to, you know, go someplace where they actually, where they actually believe they're going to have a better life. Do you think that that belief I, I, I don't mean to be pedantic. So, sorry. Go ahead. Yeah. Do you not think that that sort of belief might limit them in their <laughs> aspirations? Because they think, okay, we, we know that, um, you know, life on earth is going to be shitty. It's not a problem because it's going to be better in the end, so they don't make as much effort well, as yeah, a result. What, what, what can you do if you're in, in, in Shiristan, you know? What can you do? You're in a small village somewhere working at the factory or not at all, you know, chopping stones or whatever, you know, for a family of eight. What, what can I, you I don't do? mean to be pedantic about this, but, you know, in a lot of cases, religion is a big part of the problem. Um, the, the fact in India, you, you've got a certain amount of traditional beliefs yes. that limit their food sources. So, so how in Africa, two million a year dying from AIDS? AIDS yeah. because uh, they're Catholic. You know, the, the Catholic Church is one of the problems with Africa. Mm -hmm. um, so I, I, I'm not really sure that you're focusing on the right thing. Now, I always agree with the statement basically don't be a dick, right? Yeah. You don't want to pile on people. You don't want to proselytize to them if, that's al if they're already overloaded. But I don't think that the answer to suffering is delusion. A yeah. And I suspect that if you gave people a free choice, if they, if they had all the facts, and their choices were uh, a crappy life, believing in something that's not true, or a crappy life with the imagined reward at the end, I think most people would prefer the reality. And, and honestly, the problems are often stemming from not the religion. They're, they're stemming from something a little bit more fundamental and basic, and that is a lack of education and a lack of critical thinking and a lack of you know, resource and economic. Th th those things are, are not unrelated. Mm -hmm. um, I don't know. I'll leave it there. Yeah, well. And on that note, I am going to move on because there's um, yeah, at, least, no at, at least one more caller. But uh, it, it, interesting um, question. Thank you very much for that. Um, I understand from messages that I'm receiving from Thunder and also some of the comments I can see in the chat that uh, Cartesian theist um, wants to appear on the show. You've left it a little bit late, and I'm sorry. You know, asking how we get on the show, how many times do I have to explain this? You send a contact request. In that contact request, you include the gist of the topic or question you want to talk about. It's not difficult. It's not rocket science. But um, we'll see whether he sends an invitation. It is 20 minutes after we should have finished, but we'll see. Carter, are you with us? 
Yes, 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 I am. Hi. What have you got for us? Ah, okay. Um, oh, shit, now I forgot. Oh, fear as a motivator to people. Why do you think, let's see, why do you think fear is such a strong controller of people's motives, especially regarding theism? And that is actually ties in quite well with the previous caller that we just had. Um, and, I mean, I guess it has a lot of, I guess, beneficial reasons uh, for why we do it. And it's not uniquely human. Fear is very common, but it also causes people to do some really horrible things. So I guess there's a lot of pros and cons. So why do you think that fear is such a strong controller of people's motives? Cool, cool. I, I have an answer. I, I think in, <laughs> after, after decrying uh, narratives built on evolutionary psychology, I think this one is a valid conclusion. People who aren't afraid of things rustling in the bushes uh, didn't get very far, and that, that goes a long ways back. Fear is, of course, one of the most primal, it's one of the most uh, important uh, emotional states that, that we have evolved, developed. Um, so I think that's a big, a big issue there. People's fear of failure, their fe fear of um, all sorts of things is based on that ancient primal fear of predators and disease and uh, putrefaction. There, there's a lot of fears that we have and our, our brain is, is wired so basically towards a fear response and people of course are taking advantage of that. This is basically what Concordance was saying though is that people who don't get scared at the rustling in the bushes don't get very far because sometimes the rustling in the bushes is something that you should be afraid of and that'll kill you. However, if you're not afraid of the rustling in the bushes, I'm um, sorry, however, getting afraid every now and again when the rustling in the bushes is not a tiger doesn't kill you. Might stress you out, might not make you very happy, but that's a better strategy. In other words, being jumpy and being more scared is a better strategy than um, never. Um, it's, what, it's, it's what Michael Shermer refers to as a false positive. Um, and you can survive false positives, but you can't survive. Uh, hang on, I'm going to get this wrong. False, false negatives. negatives. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. So, so fear is the fight or flight response. And, and mm -hmm. listen to those two terms: fight or flight. You say it's bad, and it can be bad when it is that false negative. But you know that's that's your your brain and your your endocrine system, your your body preparing you to either face up to something or to run the heck away from it. That's a very desirable response. You, right. you meddle with that to your, your great detriment. Um, and then people who co-opt it for other reasons, you know, to, to motivate people. Uh, fear of failure, right? Fear of whatever. Fear of uh, public speaking. That's, a, that's a, a maladaptive trait, right? That's something that later on turned out to be disadvantageous. But the selection on the fight or flight response you can't touch it it's it's, it's a highly adaptive trait i think though uh rightly uh, we're going to have to end the show there um as concordance is messaging me the atheist experience show does start in two minutes time so we'll give everyone an opportunity um carter do feel free to uh come back on a future show can i thank very much uh cream who i know is in the room uh, for making the banner which appears above uh, the video box on Blog TV, from which you can link directly to our website, our YouTube channel, uh, Facebook channel, and the like. Thank you also to Tony, who works away wonderfully behind the scenes, bringing you the show in all its glory. And uh, on that bombshell, we will see you in two weeks' time. Thank you very much indeed to all the people that called in and everyone that came along to watch us. Take care. We'll see you soon. <laughs>